Okay, in this lecture we're going to talk about the skills that you need to become a successful developer. So let's go ahead and get started. So what really are the basic core skills that you need? The first one, perhaps it's not a skill, but it's maybe more of a virtue, but is patience. Software development can be very tedious and being a patient person and developing the patience around working with uh, long and difficult things is a necessity in software development. The next thing is good communication skills. Software development projects are very complex undertakings and require teamwork. And the teamwork will require communication with your managers, uh, other developers, and most importantly, your customers that, that are determining the requirements for the software. The next thing is the problem solving skills. Software development employs putting logic to code and, and making that transformation and putting requirements to code. So problem solving is a key aspect. The next one is to anticipate customer needs. There is no software development without customers and customers uh, require certain features in their software and you need to, to rely on customers to translate their business needs for what the software needs to do. So this is a, a critical aspect of software development. Persistence is by necessity of working with something that's complex and will require a lot of time. These projects often take months or years to complete, so being persistent on technical issues that need to be resolved, getting features out the door, and, and working on large and complex projects, uh, persistence is a must. The next one is, is the ability to adapt to change. Software tools and technology change at a rapid pace, so being able to anticipate those changes and adapt to those changes is a critical skill for programmers to develop over time. And the last one on the list is good coding skills. And most people think that this would be first on the list that you need to be a great coder to be a great programmer. Well, it's part of being a great programmer, but without the communication skills and some of the other skills, you might not get a chance to really showcase your, your great coding skills if you're writing code that is not useful to other people, or if it can't be part of a larger development effort, those coding skills will go to waste. So I'll drill down a little bit more in some of these. Uh, communication is the first one. Programming really is a team sport, and working within the team is a critical factor to success in your career. One of the things that hiring managers look for right away when they interview a potential programmer is to look for the kind of communication skills that they have and how well that they can interact with the team. This is critical as most software development projects of any size will have multiple programmers on, on the team and interacting with them is a critical work skill. Work is often done off of formal specifications. So in a large project, specifications will be written and signed off by customers and have very exacting and demanding specifications for what the software needs to do. So as a communication skill, being able to interpret those requirements is a critical skill, as well as being able to ask questions, intelligent questions, to customers to clarify exactly what they want the software to do. Development efforts are expensive and time-consuming, and progress reports to customers and management are critical. So these things are not just routine uh, formalities that uh, are an administrative thing but really outline the progress of how a software development is going. These development efforts are often very expensive and so these types of reports um, are very important uh, to the customer and the management which drives uh, the software development effort. Many systems are mission critical to a company's operating and, and operations and communicating issues and coordinating fixes can be difficult, especially during stressful times when something is broken and it's, and it's impacting the company operations. They quickly get escalated uh, to very high levels within the company and often you're exposed to uh, very stressful situations. So being a, a good communicator is critical of that. Problem solving is the next one. So IT projects I've mentioned are often large and complex. So, so uh, Fixing things becomes a, a, almost a daily task within a development effort. Soon after you put out new releases, there's often a time where uh, you'll need to make bug fixes from whatever things were introduced during the last release. 
the next bullet says things break and they do and no matter how careful a team is with testing software things will break in software uh, uh, operations and things will need to be fixed in a timely manner companies need people who can troubleshoot problems on the fly so it's not uh, just kind of a run-of-the-mill things as usual kind of day for most software developers you don't well, most of the time get the luxury of just writing new code you have to fix code that's out in production so um, problems are just not limited to bug fixes so uh, many many times unanticipated things happen and programmers are, are expected to jump in and help wherever they can and unfortunately many times these problems come during difficult times they come over holidays and weekends and particularly now that security threats have gotten much worse on, on software projects and, and environments uh, many times you might get called in the middle of the night uh, depending on where you work or what kind of projects you have or on the weekends to come fix things. The other issue that you can come about is that many companies schedule maintenance periods to be during off time so it doesn't impact their operations. So weekend and, and nighttime work uh, can be a part of software development. The next thing uh, is to anticipate customer needs. All software development projects have customers like it or not you have to live with customers even though they might be internal those are the people who determine the requirements of what your software needs to do so these are the people generally that pay for development efforts so uh, it's often critical that their demands are met uh, otherwise uh, sometimes if it goes poorly a project might be canceled so understanding customer requirements is critical to success uh, understanding what they need and translating that into software um, is really an art that you have to develop over time uh, and also customer needs change over time. A lot of times what was originally anticipated has to change and it may be due to changing market conditions, changing legislation, um, different technology. So things will change and it's best to try to embrace customer changes uh, in the most reasonable fashion. Customer service is important to your career so how you treat your customers uh, has a big impact on uh, your promotability within the organization. So keep that in mind that customer service is really a, a huge part of software development. Persistence is the next one. Fixing problems in a complex software system can be long and frustrating. Um, difficult problems are assigned to the most senior developers. So when things break that are critical, the most senior people are assigned to fix them. Uh, many times multiple approaches have to be taken because uh, uh, the first approach may not work so uh, persistence and staying with a problem uh, a problem is is a skill that you really need to master developers who can consistently fix complex problems are rewarded um, those that show the ability to really fix things on the fly are uh, often promoted to more senior positions next thing is adapting to change a change in the IT and software development business is constant so the pace of change is, is ever increasingly uh, accelerating new software and techniques come out almost daily so so keeping up with those things uh, is a definite skill that you will need to master customer needs change frequently so so your software will need to change frequently with it software must respond to market changes or else uh, or else your company may get left behind or your product will get passed up by somebody else. And, and the last bullet on here, your skills must reflect market demands and these change over time. So as the most popular languages and technologies change, you'll need to adapt those to, to be able to be marketable for your next uh, uh, position. The last one is last but not least good coding skills. It's an uh, absolute must that you are have the ability to put requirements into working code. Mastering the, the use of the debugger within the development environment that you're using is also a critical skill. The ability to produce code that's understandable by others. It's, it doesn't matter if, if you think it's the greatest thing ever. If you can't explain it to the other people on your team, it will have limited value to a project. So uh, really need to spend some time understanding how to construct things that are repeatable and explainable to others. You need to be able to formulate complex logic and workflows. So trans, again, translating customer needs into working code. The last bullet on here is programs must be repeatable and reliable. So quality and repeatability are huge metrics in software since most of the time 
these uh, systems now are running 24 by 7. So in summary, software development requires a, a number of soft skills and being a good coder, just being a good coder is not enough. Good communication skills will help your marketability and, and really help you uh, move up the ladder from a more junior position to a more senior position. Ongoing training and education are necessary in this field. You should enjoy the process of learning new technologies and, and be able to employ that over time and will greatly help uh, in your success in your career. And the last bullet is to be prepared to take on new challenges. This is a, a field that is, is constantly changing, so the ability to take on new challenges and take them on with a, uh, um, a good attitude is a huge advantage in this. So I hope you've enjoyed this lesson, and this pretty much wraps it up for this lesson, and I'll see you in the next lesson. Thank you very much. Hello. In this lesson, I'll talk about selecting a programming language to get started with. So let's go ahead and get started with the lesson. When you first get started, you should focus your development efforts on a single programming language. Once you become accomplished in one programming language, it's much simpler to learn a new language after this. Some of the most common platforms on the market today are the Microsoft.NET platform, Java from Oracle, and the LAMP platform. I refer to these as platforms since in many cases they're more than just a programming language. There are also some other platforms that are becoming more popular today and I'll talk about those in a little bit more detail later. Now I'll go through each one of these platforms in more detail. One of the most popular platforms is the .NET framework from Microsoft. It's based on the .NET framework and it's used primarily for developing applications for the Windows operating system. Although recently Microsoft has developed a version of the .NET framework for cross-platform development, it's still primarily used for Windows-based development. One of the unique things about the .NET framework is it supports multiple programming languages such as C Sharp, Visual Basic, F Sharp, and others. C Sharp is very similar to Java and it's one of the more popular languages supported by .NET. ASP.NET is the language used for web development. .NET can also be used to develop desktop applications, service development through WCF, and mobile applications. Microsoft has recently added much more support for mobile application development through some key acquisitions, such as Xamarin. Another popular platform on the market today is Java. Java was originally developed by Sun Microsystems, but that company was purchased by Oracle in 2010. Oracle now maintains and distributes Java products. Java is based on the Java Virtual Machine, or JVM. One of the unique things about Java is it can run on multiple operating systems. This means you can develop software for Windows machines, Linux machines, or the Apple iOS operating system. Java can also be used for web development through Java server pages. It can also be used to develop desktop applications, enterprise applications, and mobile applications through the use of Android Studio. The next platform we'll talk about is the LAMP platform. LAMP targets software development for the Linux operating system. LAMP utilizes the Apache web server, the MySQL database, and the PHP programming environment. All of these are free tools to be downloaded from the internet. You can purchase support contracts from commercial companies to help you run and maintain these environments. This software is very popular in university environments, nonprofit organizations, government organizations, and also some commercial applications. The free licensing cost is very popular for many organizations who choose to implement this software. There are also many other platforms out on the market today. These include languages such as Drupal, older legacy language, languages such as COBOL, and new cloud-based platforms such as Salesforce.com and Microsoft Dynamics. However, the languages I covered earlier constitute the majority of the software de development market today. Software languages and techniques are constantly changing and you should be prepared to take advantage of new opportunities as they come about. Successful programmers engage as lifelong learners, so you should be aware if you pursue a career as a programmer, you'll be constantly required to learn new languages and techniques as they change. So with all this information, how can I choose a development language? Well, first you should review vendor information on the programming languages I've just described. 
you should see if any of the information there appeals to you and is something you might want to pursue as a career. Next, you should look at the local job listings to see which types of programmers are in demand in your area. You can talk to some local staffing agencies to get their recommendations to see what companies are hiring with a particular language. You could also check with some of your friends and family to see if they know uh, what languages are being used uh, at their workplace. Finally, you could check with local universities to see what languages they teach, and this also might be a good clue as to what languages are in demand in the local area. In summary, your first programming language will be highly useful in getting your first job. However, after that, things may change after you get your first job. Technology is constantly changing and there will be opportunities to learn new technologies as they're rolled out. You should be prepared to take advantage of these new technology projects as they often lead to higher pay and possibly promotion opportunities. Don't worry about learning a second programming language. It's far easier after you've learned your first programming language. Remember, this is an industry that changes very quickly and you should expect change. This concludes this lesson. I hope it's given you some good thoughts on which programming language to choose for your training. Thank you so much, and I'll see you in the next lesson. In this lesson, we'll talk about the types of investment that you'll need to be able to complete a program that will give you sufficient background to become a successful programmer. You'll need to be able to make an investment in three key areas. These are an investment in time, support, and also a financial investment. The first area to look at is an investment in time. You'll need a substantial amount of time and commitment to be able to complete all the training necessary to become a programmer. The next area is you'll need support from your friends and family to make this happen. Do not overlook this area as it will be important since you'll need a substantial time commitment and self-discipline to be able to complete the training. The last area is in terms of a financial investment. You'll need to invest some amount of money to be able to purchase the necessary equipment, purchase some books, and also some online training or invest in a programming boot camp. It's not possible to complete this training with a zero dollar investment. You, ha you can, however, minimize the amount of money that you need to invest in the training, but thinking that you can complete a program of this complexity without any financial investment is not realistic. Now I'll drill down to each one of these areas in a little bit more detail. The first is an investment in time. The majority of your time will be spent studying materials and practicing coding. This area will require a lot of self-discipline it will help to have a regularly scheduled time and place that you can work on your programming skills. It will be ideal if you have an office or a study area where you live that can be a dedicated space that will be quiet and a great place to work regularly on your training materials. In terms of time, it's better to schedule a regular time to work on materials, much like a standard class. It's easy to let other priorities drive your schedule and fall behind on your training. Try to think of your end goals in mind as you're studying each day to prepare for your new career. Support is one area that I think many aspiring programmers often overlook. As in going back to school in a traditional program, you'll need your friends and family to help encourage and support you as you proceed throughout your training. It'd be ideal to find a mentor or somebody who is already working as a programmer that can help you. You might also reach out to local programming groups or a club that you might join so you can begin to network with people already working in the industry. You'll find some people that are already working in the industry are oftentimes willing to help you. The next area we'll talk about is the financial investment you'll need to make in order to become a programmer. I've had many of my students over the years believe they can do this by just looking at materials over the internet and not make a financial investment. I've never known anyone that's been able to accomplish this without at least a minimal investment of money. First and foremost, you'll need a very good computing environment to develop code. We'll talk about this in a later lesson and I'll show you some alternatives that can lower the cost you'll need to invest in equipment. Unfortunately, to develop code, you'll need a very fast computer. Using an old computer with a slower processor will only lead to frustration. I will include some additional estimates of costs in the planning section of this class. In summary, you need to be realistic with yourself and what you can commit to in terms of time and money to complete your training. We'll develop a plan and the timetable on an exercise later in this class. You'll be able to write down all the details you'll need to complete your plan. 
Once you develop your plan, you'll need to stick with it and work diligently to make it happen. Again, to encourage you, think of your end goals in mind. This is a growing field with very high paying jobs that will allow you an opportunity for an excellent career. Stick to it. You can do it. Thank you so much, and I'll see you in the next lesson. In this lesson, I'll talk about the type of equipment that you will need to develop code and train on. In terms of the equipment that you'll need, the first thing you'll need is a computer. You'll need to decide what is best for you, a desktop computer or a laptop. A laptop has the advantage that this is a mobile device and you re really can develop anywhere, but a desktop device is generally faster and allow you a better long-term environment for writing code. You can also use a hybrid environment by using a fast notebook computer and then attach a large screen monitor to it when you're at home so you have a much more comfortable environment to develop code on. You'll also need periodic access to a printer to print out materials to help you train for your coding exercises. You may find that you can do without this if you're comfortable reading long articles on screen. However, many people find that they prefer printed material over reading material on, on screen. This choice is really up to you. The next item you need to consider is what software you will need. You'll need a base operating system to run your software development environment tools, office automation software, and backup software. The choice will depend on the programming language you decide to develop on. I'll cover this more in more detail in the upcoming slides. The last item you'll need is some basic home networking equipment. You will need access to the internet and you'll need to decide if you have a notebook computer as your computer of choice. You also need a wireless connection to make your development environment portable. Fortunately, home wireless connections are very affordable and now easy to come by. Next, you'll need to decide on your preferred programming language. Some of the more common choices for programming languages are Java from Oracle, the .NET platform from Microsoft, or the LAMP platform, which is really Linux, MySQL, and PHP. If you're going to develop for the Java platform, you can either utilize Windows operating system or Linux. If you decide to develop with Microsoft.NET, you really have no choice but to develop on the Windows platform. Also, if you decide to develop for the LAMP platform, you really need to run Linux as your development computer. Another consideration is to decide whether you're going to develop web-based applications, software for mobile applications, or desktop software. If you decide you're going to develop mobile applications, you'll probably need several physical devices to test your software on. Although you can use emulators for this, it's best to run final tests on actual physical hardware to make sure they work without any issues. Here's some pitfalls to avoid when you're building your development environment. I can't emphasize enough that you'll need to get the fastest computer you can possibly afford to develop code on. Developing on old hardware and software will only lead to frustration and present a huge hurdle for you to overcome. Most of the software vendors now have free development tools that you can download from the internet. Examples of this are Microsoft Visual Studio Community Edition, the Eclipse environment for Java, and tools for Linux and LAMP development. I'll include links for these on how to get these tools as an attachment to this lesson. As far as the hardware necessary for a typical .NET environment, you'll need a PC with a minimum of an i5 processor, although an i7 processor or equivalent is preferred. You'll also need a minimum of 8 gigabytes of RAM, although, again, 16 would be better if you can afford it. Windows 10 is the current operating system and probably the best environment for the current .NET development, although you could use Windows Server 2012 if you're using the cloud for development environment. You should also get a one terabyte hard drive for installing software such as Visual Studio Community Edition 2015, Microsoft SQL Server Express, and you can use Visual Studio Team Services for source control. Next, for a typical de Java development environment, you should have the choice of using a PC or a Mac Either one of these should have at least an i5 processor or better. You'll need 8 gigabytes of RAM on your computer, although once again 16 would be better if you can afford it. After getting your PC, you can download and install Eclipse for free, as well as the MySQL database from Oracle. You can also use Visual Studio Team Services for source control, even though it's a Microsoft product. It's also a free web-based product. 
For the LAMP environment, you can probably get by with a little less processor since the Linux, Linux operating system is very lightweight in terms of resources. There are many varieties of the Linux operating such as Ubuntu, Red Hat, and others. You'll have to decide which one is best for you. Your last consideration for your development environment is to consider building your development environment in the cloud. Microsoft Am Azure and Amazon AWS both offer reasonable hosting fees to build your development server on. You can build a very fast machine and only pay for the server when it's running. By doing this, you can build a much faster machine in the cloud and simply turn it off when you're not using it. Both Microsoft and Amazon offer free packages to get started. However, these machines are typically not fast enough to run complex development environments. Another advantage of developing cloud-based servers is the internet connection to these machines is extremely fast, and downloading and installing software is significantly faster in the cloud than on your home computer. I'm currently doing this and I found my productivity has increased significantly. Another advantage of doing this is you will not have to invest in a fast computer. Simply rent the time on the cloud and pay for what you use. I highly recommend you do this. If you do this, make sure you turn the computer off when you're not using it, as these vendors charge by the minute for a running computer. I'm currently spending about $20 to $30 a month to run my development server on Amazon AWS. In summary, just a few tips for you as you build your development environment. The first one is to find the fastest hardware you can afford, as these development tools use a lot of resources and you'll be frustrated with the slow development environment if you do not get a fast computer. I also highly recommend that you look at cloud alternatives to lower your cost and, inc and increase your compute power. Also make sure you keep your software tools up to the latest version. This again will help minimize problems that you encounter along the way. Another tip is to utilize source control so you can store the code you're, as you're practicing along the way. You can use such tools as a Visual Studio Team System, CodePlex, or even Dropbox to store your source code. After investing a lot of time of writing code, you don't want to lose it by not having it backed up in a proper location. This can concludes the lesson. I hope I've given you some good information on building your development environment. Thank you very much, and I'll see you in the next lesson. Thanks again.